In this video, we'll learn about vector and matrix norms. This presentation is divided into three parts. First, we'll cover vector norms, then matrix norms. We'll conclude by discussing the purpose and application of norms in numerical methods. As usual, we'll start with vector norms before moving on to matrix norms because vector-based concepts tend to be generally simpler than matrix-based concepts. Put simply, a norm is a way to measure the size of a vector or matrix. In essence, norms allow us to quantify its magnitude. We like to do so because oftentimes we're comparing vectors or matrices to other vectors or matrices. Because vectors and matrices have multiple elements, it can be difficult to know exactly what we're comparing. Take for example the vectors p and q. Answering whether p and q are similar isn't exactly straightforward. The first elements of p and q are identical, so you could argue that p and q are similar in that regard. Both vectors have a zero, albeit in different locations, so you could add that to your argument. You can easily argue that p and q are not similar for both of the reasons I just gave. For instance, you could say that because p and q only share the same first element, the majority of the elements in both vectors don't match. Therefore, we need a single number to describe a vector or matrix so we can holistically compare them. There are many ways to compute the norm. We'll learn about three different types of norms. They all stem from this formula down here, which represents the p-norm. The double bars around the variable denote the norm. It's called the p-norm because the p is used as a placeholder variable to denote which type of norm is calculated. p can theoretically take on any positive integer, but the most common values are 1, 2, and infinity. If you take p equals 1, then you substitute 1 for all of the p's, and so forth. When we substitute p equals 1 into the formula from the last slide, we get this equation. This is called the 1 norm, L1 norm, or the Manhattan norm. We compute the 1 norm by taking the sum of the absolute values of every element in the vector. Let's say we have a two element vector x. The 1 norm of x is the sum of the absolute values of both elements. Basically, it represents the total length of the vector. Graphically, it represents the distance it takes to traverse to the point specified by the vector from the origin, only traveling along the Cartesian axes. The Manhattan norm moniker alludes to the grid layout of New York City's streets. Just as cars travel vertically or horizontally within the borough to get to a point, the one norm is calculated along the vertical and horizontal dimensions. It represents the total length of the vector. If we substitute p equals 2 into the equation from slide 4, we get the 2 norm or the Euclidean norm. This is the norm you're probably the most familiar with. It's just the straight line distance from the origin to the point specified by the vector. To compute it, we sum the square of each individual element. When p equals infinity, we obtain the infinity norm or max norm. It's defined as the absolute value of the largest element within the vector. This norm is often used in worst case scenarios. For example, say we have a vector representing some noise added to a signal. We could compute the infinity norm of the vector to identify the maximum amount of noise injected into the signal. Here's a quick example demonstrating the computation of each norm using a three element vector x. The one norm is the sum of the absolute value of each element, which gives us one plus four plus two equals seven. The 2 norm is just a Euclidean distance, so we take the square root of the sum of the squares. Finally, the infinity norm is just the entry with the largest magnitude, aka 4. On the right, I drew the graphical representations of the 1 norm and 2 norm. The 1 norm can be thought of the total distance spanned by the vector. Starting from the origin, we move 1 unit in the negative x direction, 4 unit in the positive y direction, and 2 units up in the positive z direction. In total, we travel 7 units. The 2 norm is just a straight line distance from the origin to the point, which comes out to be about 4.5 units. The underlying concept behind vector norms can be extended to matrices. The 1 norm for matrices is similar to the 1 norm for vectors. For vectors, the 1 norm is calculated by summing the absolute values of the entries. We basically do the same thing, but repeat it for every column in the matrix. We scan down each column of the matrix and sum the magnitudes of each entry. Then, we take the largest sum across the columns. This is why it's also referred to as the column sum norm. The 2 norm for matrices actually involves some material beyond the scope of the course, so we'll skip it for now and proceed directly to the infinity norm.
The matrix infinity norm is pretty much identical to the matrix 1 norm, but we scan across each row instead of down each column. Within each row, we sum the magnitudes of all the elements, then we pick the largest summation. This is also fittingly referred to as the row sum norm. Here's a quick example of the matrix 1 norm. We take the sum of each column in the A matrix, so we end up with 7 plus 4 plus 10 in the first column, 1 plus 5 plus 4 in the second column, and 8 plus 8 plus 2 in the third column. This gives us 21, 10, and 18. The largest of these three sums is 21, which is the column sum norm. The infinity norm is the same as the column sum norm, but we sum across the rows instead. This gives us 7 plus 1 plus 8 in the first row, 4 plus 5 plus 8 in the second row, and 10 plus 4 plus 2 in the third row. The largest sum is 17 in the second row, so our row sum norm is 17. For relatively small vectors and matrices, computing the norm by hand is pretty easy, but for relatively large items, it's probably more feasible to calculate it in MATLAB. The MATLAB function norm accepts two inputs. Z is a vector or matrix, and P represents which norm you want to compute. If you omit the P argument from the function call, it will default to the two norm for both vectors and matrices. P usually takes on the three values seen in this slideshow, 1, 2, or infinity. If z is a vector, you can also supply negative infinity, which does the same thing as the infinity norm, but picks the smallest magnitude element in the vector instead of the largest magnitude element. You can also technically supply any positive scalar for p, but that's only used in very rare applications. For matrices, you can set p to the string fro to calculate the Frobenius norm, which is another special norm type that's beyond the scope of the class. Here's a list of some common p-values you can use in the norm function along with its formula in MATLAB syntax. This table was actually taken directly from the MATLAB documentation. As usual, I encourage you to thoroughly read the documentation for the norm function. Here are two screenshots illustrating the usage of the norm function applied to the examples we did earlier. The left screenshot uses the same vector we had in slide 8. The last norm demonstrates what happens when you set p equals to negative infinity. It returns 1, which is the smallest absolute value element in the x vector. The right screenshot repeats the matrix norm examples from slides 12 and 13 in MATLAB. So far, we've discussed what norms are and how to calculate them, but we haven't yet discussed why they're important or how they're used in numerical methods. One of the biggest motivators of norms is to enable comparisons between vectors and matrices. This is especially common in fields like machine learning, which rely on comparing something like a known piece of information to an estimate. Norms are favorable in this context because they can condense large matrices down to a single number, no matter what kind of norm you use. The L1 norm is used extensively in machine learning in a technique called lasso. Although you don't need to know what lasso is, I'll give a very simplified explanation because I think it's cool. Lasso is like linear regression. When you perform linear regression on a dataset, you obtain the regression coefficients that represents the best fit line or curve. When you do lasso regression, you penalize the less important or less prominent parts of your dataset. This prevents overfitting your data and makes your model more versatile when applied to other datasets. The penalization is computed using the L1 norm. The infinity norm is extensively used in modern control systems engineering. In fact, there's a whole subfield called H-infinity or robust control, which deals with measuring the performance of a control system. In classical control systems, an input signal is fed through a controller and you receive an output signal. For example, the input signal could be the amount you press down on the throttle of your car, and the resulting output signal could be the car's velocity. In the real world, there's always some uncertainty. For example, there could be some noise entering your system, or the input signal could be slightly corrupted. In a nutshell, H-infinity control uses matrix norms to design the control system to account for uncertainty. Perhaps the most immediately relevant application of norms is in your MATLAB grader workshops. As you know by now, the p-codes are black box functions which accept your answers and compare them to the solution. You pass the test if your answers are sufficiently close to the solution. More specifically, I use the infinity norm to determine whether you pass or fail a test case. This is a code snippet from the p-code associated with the robot navigation problem. I generate the error vector between my answer and your answer, and then take the infinity norm of the error vector. If the maximum error within the vector is under the threshold of 1e negative 3, you pass the test. This methodology is generally present in the other p-codes as well. 
The last important application of the normal cover is something called the condition number. The condition number is a trendy topic in the error analysis side of numerical methods, but we unfortunately don't have enough time to cover it in depth in this semester. Essentially, the condition number of a matrix measures the system's sensitivity to small changes in the forcing function. The condition number will always be at least 1. The larger the condition number gets, the more x changes when b changes slightly. The condition number bounds the error on the solution vector. The larger the condition number, the less reliable your x vector is. To conclude, norms provide a handy metric which directly enables matrix and or vector comparisons. There are three main types of norms, the 1, 2, and infinity norm. You can calculate them by hand pretty readily for small matrices and vectors, or you can use the norm function in MATLAB instead. Thanks and see you next time.